Hi, my name is Dr. Andrea Gehring, and I'm an instructor of physics and astronomy at Lane Community College in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, and I'm Richard Wagner. I am also an instructor at Lane. And um, our talk today is about authoring to enable future adopters. Um, we're going to discuss the supplemental materials that we have developed for our astronomy courses aligned with OpenStax astronomy uh, and the process of design that we went through to put these materials together. All right, I first want to tell you a little bit about why we started this project and how we decided on its scope. So our original courses were a sequence of three independent topics um, covering different astronomy areas over three 10 week terms. Um, our students earn lab credit for this course. And originally we used a traditional textbook with an online homework platform, which costs students $60 per term. Um, since there are three uh, sections per term and 24 students per section, this was an estimated total cost per academic year of $13,000. Once we switched to OpenStax Astronomy and supplemented that with the in-class activities we've developed, now the textbook cost for students is zero dollars. Uh, when we started out the project, sort of one of the first things we did was uh, take a look at what resources were currently existing, uh, open resources for open tech astronomy. Uh, through searching from some of our known resources, as well as some of the information posted previously on OER Commons, uh, there's about 170 or more labs coming from 10 different resources, mostly universities all across the U.S. Um, about 30% of those are OER, and then the other 70% were copyrighted or had no specific source referenced. Um, so we've gone through and sort of indexed all of these and aligned them with where they appear in the textbook. Uh, we've also used quite often uh, clicker style questions from um, the University of Nebraska's, uh, what's NAAP stand for, Andrea? I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember that acronym. What it Wait, uh, it's an astronomy uh, education resource program for the University of Nebraska. Um, there are versions of OER lecture slides from various sources. Uh, and then, of course, we had activities, labs, and slides all coming from our original courses that we wanted to adopt and uh, evolve into an OER version. Awesome. Um, so I also looked into what commons, um, sorry, what resources already existed on OER commons, uh, because there was a group for OpenStax astronomy. So um, what I found was about 46 total resources before we published ours. Um, 18 of these were basically link collections by the textbook authors, things like um, resources related to women in astronomy, um, people of color in astronomy, uh, resources related to good books, films, and plays about astronomy. So those kinds of link collections are helpful for building activities and homeworks, but they're not themselves ready to go activities, labs, or homeworks. Um, I did find a lot of resources that were individual, um, but Richard mentioned that he found many more of those published in lots of other locations across the web. Um, there aren't so many that were actually on OER Commons ready to use. Um, and there were also two complete courses, but what I found was that the most comprehensive resources were a little bit hard to navigate, um, somewhat incomplete, and in some cases too comprehensive. So I wanna show you a few things here. This is what OER Commons looks like. There's multiple groups and hubs associated with OER Commons. This is the OpenStax Astronomy group. And as you can see, there's 200 and some members and 50 some affiliated resources within this collection. So this is where I went to look for material specifically aligned with the textbook we chose. Uh, when I discussed that some of the um, existing full courses were a little bit difficult to navigate, um, this is an example of one it's organized into modules, but there's no document that sort of links together and tells you what's within each. So you have to open each folder individually, and sometimes even then open each resource individually to know what it's about. Um, there were also some collections published uh, that linked together OpenStax astronomy chapter sections with specific lecture tutorials and labs used in astronomy. So this was really helpful um, to get us started. And um, this is an example of uh, uh, one of those list collections by one of the textbook authors. This one was uh, free online lab activities for intro astronomy. It wasn't actually published until after we began 
uh, our project. And as you can see, this is what I mean by maybe a little bit too comprehensive. Uh, this is just for chapter one, which is a short chapter, all of the options. So, you know, this is a 30 page document with lots of links in it. It's great for finding exactly what you might need, um, but it's not sort of organized in a plug and play kind of ready to use way. Uh, when we moved in to actually start doing things, uh, we had, and by doing things, I mean transitioning to an OER source and making those available. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had easily accessible and digestible uh, materials that were aligned with OpenStax. Uh, we wanted to have lecture slides where we had built-in clicker questions, discussions, and activities. Uh, Angie and I are both of the uh, sort of persuasion that uh, student active engagement is really important in helping them learn. So having that built in directly into the lecture slides uh, was really important to us. We also wanted to make sure we had at least daily in-class activities. Uh, part of that was to make sure the students were getting their lab, lab credit for the course, uh, but also to improve their engagement. Uh, we moved toward project-based assessments and de-emphasized quizzes or exams. Uh, and then we wanted to make sure we wanted to publish our resources at the end. So those are the goals. Uh, we have accomplished those goals now. Um, all of the chapters from the Open Sector Autonomy textbook, um, we have produced active learning slide decks. Uh, we've also had, uh, since we sort of divided up the book into three independent courses where students taking the second winter term course, there's no expectation they took the course in the fall. So that means all of the introductory material and ideas that we have to introduce to start, start building on, we have to teach each term. So we wanted to make sure that introductory material that we had specific versions aligned with each general topic. So the students that are taking the course studying the solar system, they're going to get a different version of the introduction than the students who are going to take the course when they're learning about stars because they have to know different concepts and have to emphasize different ideas for those. Uh, we also have gone through and tried to make these slides uh, as accessible as possible with accessible colors, as well as image alt text for our students who may be using screen readers to look at our lecture slides or uh, faculty who are trying to adopt them that would like those screen reader resources. Uh, we ended up just creating or adapting 126 activities that are released on our OER comments currently. Those are a mixture of labs, uh, article analysis where they're reading and investigating uh, scientific publications, uh, tutorial activities, quantitative work, as well as student jigsaws where they're teaching each other. We've published uh, 16 different project prompts, and some of those ideas uh, came out of those longer resources um, where they're looking at uh, societal impacts or scientist spotlight where they're looking at diversity in science. Uh, and then in July, um, we have released all of these resources uh, as Google Suite documents um, with sort of large overarching uh, Google, uh, what's the word, Google Sheets um, list indexing of all the material to make it accessible. And you'll see that here in a little bit. All right, next, uh, we want to discuss how we supported uh, this project. So some of our earliest introductions to OER came from the online course design introduction workshops that LCC's Center for Teaching and Learning were uh, putting together early in the pandemic to transition us to remote teaching. Uh, in particular, this was really helpful on learning more about accessibility and universal design for learning. This was really important when it came to making our presentations accessible in this project. Uh, it also just introduced us to the idea that there's OER out there and that you can also contribute as an author. Uh, this kind of sparked my interest in OER more. And so I continued my learning journey with Open Oregon Educational Resources uh, in their Equity and Open Education faculty cohort, uh, where I learned more about the move toward open education um, and using OER as an opportunity to weave more representation into course materials um, make them more representative of a, a broader diversity of participants. Uh, we also participated in training through the library at Lane Community College. So uh, over the past two summers, I think they, or maybe the past, I don't know, two summers we were involved with, uh, there was a three, four week hybrid workshop um, where faculty investigated existing OER resources uh, looked at backward design in order to intentionally restructure one of their courses coming up for the fall term. 
uh, develop new resources with an eye focusing on that accessibility that we found important, uh, as well as ultimately cleaning up those resources they developed in order to share. Uh, this is a funded project by the library, which is really important for both Andrea and I uh, are not permanent faculty at LCC. So having that uh, funding resources for even adjunct faculty um, to do course development was very nice because most places uh, aren't going to pay adjuncts to redevelop develop their courses. But this is one route we took it. Um, Andrea, I think three summers ago now, uh, participated at one level where she was just investigating those existing resources. Uh, and then two summers ago, we both um, did a full adoption and development uh, resource or method for the workshop um, to totally redevelop uh, our first fall term astronomy course. So as Richard mentioned, I did the OER summer camp investigation in summer 2020. And then in summer 2021, both of us did the OER summer camp adopt and develop a new course. Uh, where we redesigned Astronomy 121. In order to continue uh, and redesign Astronomy 122 and 123, we wanted to apply for a grant from Open Oregon Educational Resources. Unfortunately, we did not receive that grant, but the OER librarian at LCC came to the rescue and was able to support us in uh, adopting and developing the OER Astronomy textbook for 122 and 123. All right, so now we've scoped out our project. Um, we have secured support and uh, we wanna now talk about how we developed the project and in particular, how we went about um, collaborating. So after the OER investigation summer camp, uh, I decided that I liked the OpenStax astronomy textbook, that there were also sufficient resources out there to uh, develop new materials related to the textbook. And so Richard and I made the decision to switch to the open textbook about two weeks prior to the start of fall term. Um, this worked out pretty well for us, actually, even though it seems like it might be a risky move, uh, we were able to quickly get the course in shape. And then over the next year, we developed materials primarily with an eye toward using them internally. So we decided on the chapters and topics to include for each course based on our original course learning objectives. Uh, we drafted a lot of new materials, including slides, activities, and projects. A lot of these used existing course material that we had used in the past, but we made many new activities that were um, better integrated with the new textbook. We also did a lot of quiz bank development during this time, and our collaboration process was to meet weekly uh, to assign tasks for the upcoming weeks. So it was not so different from what you might do for your normal course prep except that we were drafting specifically for the new textbook. Uh, as we developed new activities, there were very specific things we needed to keep in mind uh, as we sort of developed them. Uh, we wanted to try to scaffold complex ideas for students as much as possible, rather than sort of throwing just ideas at them in lecture and then trying to get them to apply them, sort of building that groundwork to help them uh, build up to conclusion or make a discovery on their own was really important. We wanted to focus and ground all of our work, both the activities as well as our lectures, our discussions, our homeworks, on the observational evidence that astronomers actually use to make these determinations and how we learn things about astronomy was really important. We wanted our activities to be lab-like and qualitative, quantitative um, when possible, since our students are earning lab credit for all three of our courses. Uh, we like the idea of using online resources um, when it was uh, available. Uh, it allows, we draw lots of pictures in our slides. Um, we use pictures from NASA, since that's a really good resource that we have available to get astronomy uh, images. Uh, but there's lots of simulations and videos um, that exist that students can use and engage with and interact with. We wanted our students to uh, research astronomy topics independently. That's partially in the project as well as some of their jigsaw activities where they're researching an idea and then coming back to the class and sharing those ideas with their classmates. It's important uh, for us and certainly for my background in uh, scientific education is that students uh, are able to understand popular science articles on astronomy topics. Uh, the James Webb was really convenient uh, to launch right at the end of our project because we got to uh, talk a lot about that opportunity uh, to learn new astronomy that way. We like our students to collaborate with classmates. Uh, so most of the activities 
uh, are designed for students to talk and discuss and come up with ideas together. They can certainly complete most of the activities on their own, but it's far uh, easier when they can collaborate. And of course, we want the activities to be fun rather than have our students uh, just not enjoying their experiences in our classroom. Awesome. Um, a couple other things I wanted to add here was that this idea of scaffolding up um, complex ideas using multiple representations, all of this is also informed by what we learned about universal design for learning. Um, so that was really important for us to uh, try to make these activities as you know approachable as possible so that our students enjoy them. All right, so for the entire collection, uh, the activities as well as the projects and slides, we wanted them to really work seamlessly together so that students had sort of a unified experience the same way they would in say the original situation where we had a textbook plus homework platform that were linked perfectly. Uh, we also wanted these to be modular and easily remixable since we're on a three term system, but most other universities and colleges are on semester systems. So we wanted it to be easy for instructors to go in and um, choose the pieces that they needed for their courses. Uh, we wanted to organize our resource collection intuitively and make sure that it was searchable. And we also wanted all the materials to feel um, inviting and engaging. Now it came time uh, to release the project, uh, which we have now done. Uh, so we needed to edit the stuff that we had developed during the previous academic year. So summer 2021, uh, we got involved with the OER adoption summer camp that was through the library again. Uh, we needed to rewrite our course learning outcomes to make sure they're aligning with all of these new activities or make sure the activities are aligning with what we want the students to learn. We needed to choose what sort of materials we're actually gonna release. Uh, and then we had to go through and uh, make everything OER accessible, as well as update any material that we could use for the fall. This was just during the summer. So I would like to do a little bit of review, recall some of your knowledge. Uh, which of these types of materials have we released in the OER comments? Uh, I'm gonna give you just a short bit of time uh, to type your selected answers. You can just type the numbers uh, in the chat. Uh, this type of question will show up commonly. Uh, it's a multiple choice question, of course. Um, and rather than use letters to do multiple choice, which is more common, we use numbers. Uh, I encourage my students to hold up their hand and show me the number of fingers that they like for the answers, uh, rather than use actually like uh, clickers that they have to invest $40 in to use over the course of a term. Uh, that's, of course, um, really available. So you guys selected most of the correct answers in the chat. We released lecture slides as well as the in-class uh, activities. Uh, and we've, of course, also released uh, student project prompts. So these other resources, um, we kept internal to ourselves, um, which I think Andrew wanted to talk a little bit about. Why yeah, um, yeah. one of the, the considerations was that we didn't necessarily want to publish our entire question bank um, for our homeworks and exams. So some of our homeworks actually are uh, published as in-class activities in our resource collection, um, but the exam question bank in particular, we thought uh, that needed to be really mapped onto our own learning objectives. And it was the same with the video recordings of lecture. Even though we did take video recordings of our lectures when we were teaching remotely, it was just too specific for our class. Um, and so I decided there were already pre-existing video lectures for um, that were already released on OER Commons. We didn't need another set. So during our second year of work, we um, prepared materials for the rest of the world. So we decided what to release and what not to release. Uh, we went and prioritized and organized um, our existing material and put together an internal uh, inventory, which I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, we then had to, you know, repeat this process for the winter and spring materials, and we met about monthly to check in on uh, what where, what progress we had made. So let me see here. So here's the one of the examples of the internal inventory that we made. Um, we essentially just made a huge link list of all of our lectures, our activities, et cetera. Uh, and we had different um, kind of status columns. And this was where Richard and I could make notes of what we had done, what still needed to be done, um, 
And so we had a chance to also review each other's work, which was especially important when we were both authors of the original activity and we wanted the other uh, editor to come in and make sure that everything looked good. All right, and finally, we published our material um, just this year. It's organized by topic and by textbook chapter, um, and the activities um, give notes on the requirements for the technology um, and also directions for active learning techniques that might not be commonly used so that instructors know how that they're, we intended them to be used. Uh, we also created sample syllabi for our 10 week terms. And uh, I think that using Google Docs for this makes the five R's uh, really easy. It's really easy to remix the materials. So let me go ahead and show you finally our published collection. Um, it's here on OER Commons. Um, it is organized into a spreadsheet. And so we've got it organized by class, um, by slides and activities. And just to give you a little bit of a, a feel for this, we've got chapters and then we've broken down each lecture um, collection by topic. Um, so it's really easy to go in here and search for what you might need. Um, the activities are also um, organized by chapter, uh, but you can also sort these by the type of activity. So if you're looking, for example, for just a quantitative lab, then you can go in and find that. Uh, so sort of looking back at what we've done and the sort of things we discovered along the way, uh, I think it was important to uh, consider different formats for the activities or for the lectures um, more carefully or very carefully. Uh, we originally started this when we were remote, so all of our resources were developed for the remote environment. Uh, and then we went to update it and we moved, transitioned back to in-person. So there was a lot of updating and changing that had to happen uh, to transition from that sort of remote environment where we asked students to use all these online resources and then we get into the classroom and that was much more challenging to use. Um, switching that format was actually something Andrea's already done. She's taught this with a large course sum. How did that go? Went great. The lecture slides in particular were really easy to adapt and the in-class activities, I had to make them shorter to suit my shorter class size uh, or class time, but that worked as well. Uh, coming out of this, uh, the other courses I've taught, um, I've had an increased uh, effort to sort of build in OER materials uh, in the courses, use open source images rather than uh, things I just steal from the internet from, you know, complicated sources. Uh, I've also found this has been really helpful um, beyond just this astronomy course, uh, the material, actually parts of the lectures, uh, as well as the style that we developed for lectures has filtered into other courses that I've taught. Um, and I've also found it was really important to keep track of sources, particularly the first fall, I was not very good at keeping track of sources. Uh, so when we went back to redevelop that material or clean it up for OER publication, I spent a lot of time trying to retrack down uh, images that uh, I had used because I didn't save the source. Boom. But we did learn Google reverse image search is really helpful. Yeah. Um, some of my reflections are that um, planning for accessibility up front, uh, I think we should have done a little bit more of. Uh, we ended up, you know, retrofitting material that we had already been using, um, adding things like image alt text. Um, and like Richard said, that was it was just kind of difficult to do that for every image in a large pre-existing lecture slide set. Um, we also had to go back and change colors at one point because there were some non-colorblind friendly and um, colors that didn't have good enough contrast in our slide themes. And so if we had known that up front, then we would have built that in from the very beginning. Um, something that we did do was ask for permission. There were several times where there were materials that we wanted to use, but those um, were published online and didn't have a Creative Commons license attached to them. So we just emailed people and asked if we could use their materials and explained what we were doing. And most people were really happy um, to let us do so. Um, I found that this was really important to, you know, support curriculum development work that needed to be done for this sequence anyway. Um, and having this supported was kind of a different way than we would have had support to do curriculum development from the universe or from the college. And yeah, now I, as well as Richard, find that the style of lecture and the materials themselves, they filter into the rest of my work. And in fact, this uh, is the exact same slide style that we use in our entire um, collection. All right, 
So hopefully we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Thank you very much. And I look forward to continuing the conversation.